Hi folks, welcome to the final episode for this podcast for the Tour de France 2024. Today we're going to go through the last stages, stages 18 through 21. We'll do the play-by-play for those. We'll also go through the beginning of the race. It's, it was three weeks ago already. You forgot that Bardet won the first stage, didn't you? We're going to go through the, the winners, the losers, the overall standings, uh, what teams are happy, what teams are mad. And I don't want to talk about doping, but it's a question that I'm getting a ton. I don't want to ignore that. I'm going to know what I see, what I don't see, uh, and kind of just how it feels from my perspective. Quick reminder, this is also a podcast. Uh, you can check that out and listen on audio. This episode, I'll go ahead and do a shout out for Invisiframe. That's my title sponsor for Worst Retirement Ever this year. Uh, Invisiframe is a paint protection for your bicycles. They're owned by Expel, which Expel does it for, for fancy cars. They have OEM deals with all kinds of car brands. So the kind of little under underneath the car, like certain panels that are likely to get hit up by, but you might already have this on your car uh, that'll get hit by gravel. And what, what it does, it's this plastic uh, invisible film that goes over it. Uh, it's a few different layers, so the stuff will bounce off it. And if it scratches, it'll penetrate. And then the, the plastic will just, over time, uh, being out in conditions, it will melt a tiny bit and it will heal the scratches really before you know they're there. Uh, that same film is available for bicycles through Invisiframe. They have patterns for all kinds of bikes. They also have, if they don't have a pattern specific to your bike, uh, they also have a universal kit that you can get. Uh, there is a Phil sent me for that, but really great products. Nice to have that on all my bikes. One less thing to worry about when I lean up against a wall. I appreciate them making our bikes last longer and for their support of what I do. All right, let's get into it. Stage 17, it finally happened. Stage 18, another one. 17, uh, EF had stacked the brake. Carapaz won. 18 EF tried the same move really. They had they had numbers in the break. They were looking good. Uh, they were attacking. They were being very aggressive, trying to split up. The break was so big it was basically a new peloton. It was 40 something dudes. So they were trying to race out of that race. Ultimately, it split and they missed it. A group of three. So we had Michael Kwiatkowski from Ineos. Ineos's really last chance to get a stage win this tour, which is which mind boggling. Uh, Victor Campanerts and then uh, Matteo Verche, who I don't think any of us had ever heard of before. Uh, that was the split. There was a chase group of five that looked like it might make it across, but just didn't quite. There was too much gas in the breakaway, and they weren't working too smoothly together. It kind of looked like a slam dunk for Kwiatkowski, but he did not pull it off. Campanaires smashed that sprint. A beautiful interview by him, if you want to find that. You can always tell it's a good guy when his teammates are at the the podium celebration, kind of clapping for him, and they all, like, they could all be in the bus taking a shower, but those guys were stoked for their boy. So it was Verche from Total Energies was second, and Kwiatkowski third. Uh, fourth place, Tom Squinch lit up the chase group for five. Uh, big miss by Trek, not having him get across to that. Super bummer for them. Really the big loser was Ineos on that one. Uh, Kwiatkowski kind of just botched the sprint, unlike him. Okay, stage 19 is where it started to get a little bit awkward. There was a break, it had three and a half minutes. The field kept it close. Uh, it didn't look that close, but it was always too close for a tough finale. They never had a chance. They just never had a chance. It looked like it might be a nail biter, but in reality, it was, if you knew what you were looking at, it was a slow motion train wreck. Uh, Matteo Jorgensen had an incredible attack at the very bottom of this final climb. Uh, just dropped a bunch of hitters in the breakaway. And it's like, oh, Matteo's gonna go in solo for a finish. But when the lead group is, is three, three and a half minutes back, he, he, he just never had it, and it was painful to watch the next, like, 20, 25 minutes where Tade did the same thing. He just lit up the, the leaders and came right through everyone, just like a steamroller through the breakaway, through Mateo, and across the line for a very dominant, impressive win. I think Mateo knew the whole time he attacked early because I think he knew his real competition was going to come from three and a half minutes back, not from the guys in the group with him. He just had to go best time from bottom to top. There was a funny race behind him between Simon Yates and Carapaz kind of going back and forth, except everyone's coming, guys. Heartbreaker for Mateo, who these are his home roads near Nice. Uh, he had a very classy interview after. He actually had the thought to like thank his teammates and thank his team. Uh, very nice dude. He did get the consolation prize of moving into ninth overall. Top 10 at the tour, not a bad consolation. I posted on threads or something after the stage that I think Tade is already thinking about Cavendish's stage win record uh, a couple years down, but boy, is he his, his numbers look pretty promising to get that eventually if he stays at the level he is. Uh, and someone said, no kidding, he already said that three days ago. It's all right, listen, dorks, I'm not watching every interview, okay? I've got other things to do. Also notable from that stage, uh, Remco went for it against Vingigo again. He was trying to creep away some time. He's still looking at second overall. And Jonas slapped him down. Jonas was like, no, man, I, you know, I had my moments here and there. But uh, Jonas came in a very solid second and put that situation to rest. 
I think the rest of us knew it a couple weeks ago, but this was the day that Jonas finally accepted, like, I did not win the tour, uh, camera up in his face while he's crying on his wife's shoulder at the finish. But the story of the day, of course, was how fast Tade was, how dominant he was. This was the performance that put it over the line for some folks of, this is unbelievable, we don't believe in this guy anymore. Apparently Lance Armstrong on his podcast said that Tade, yo man, you're making it too obvious that you're doping today. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I would know, man, I would know. That dude is such a trip. To pretend you're the victim of baseless accusations your entire career and like ruin people's lives and sue them to oblivion when you know deep down they're actually telling the truth and then go out 30 years later and make baseless accusations, it's wild. The whole thing where the conversation is like, what do you think this guy's on? What do you think that guy's on? Like that goes directly back to Lance. That's when I got my tattoo. People keep doing these climb comparisons. They're looking at the climbs from Pantani and Lance and Ulrich and all those guys. And of course, Tade smashed a ton of those this year. And you look at that, it's like, oh, well, that's a bad sign. But then look at, this is 25, 30 years ago for a lot of those. Think about if you went to ride Pantani's bike right now up a hill, you'd be like, ew. Like everything has progressed, all sports progress, uh, technology has progressed, aerodynamics, equipment, and then you get into like nutrition and training. Uh, every sport is gonna get faster over time. Cycling from a, f a certain era was gonna regress a little bit and then progress uh, over time. But then you look at those climb comparisons and it's kind of fun, I like looking at it too, but they leave out so many variables such as you know, was it week one or week three of the race? Was it a mountaintop finish or was the group just sort of cruising? So the race conditions and then, you know, weather, air pressure, all this stuff uh, really can affect the overall time up even a kind of steep climb and then throw in the 25, 30 years aspect. And I'm sorry, those numbers are just straight up meaningless. The thing that I saw on that stage, which is the same that we saw with, with Vingago in the time trial last year, in my opinion, is that whoever's the best overall is going to really stamp that they're the best when everyone else is finally fatigued when we get towards the end of it, we get in the meat of it, and here's a day where they're good and nobody else is. Am I saying Tade is clean? No, I don't know that guy. But I see a lot of comments like, man, don't be naive, everyone's doing it. No, they're not. That is absolutely not true. I know a lot of guys in the Peloton still, I'm very close friends with a handful of them. Cut my hand off if so-and-so is dirty. And these are guys who, you know, I'm not, I'm not best friends with anyone on the podium, but I'm super tight with people who are very high up, who have gotten significant results this year, whose names have been mentioned uh, in these events, who I trust thoroughly. So is everyone doing it? No, even back then that wasn't the case. The problem is that the people who were doing it, if the drugs work, they go right to the top and then they get the voice. They get to tell you like, oh, everyone was doing it. And they say that to make themselves feel better, but it was never true. So the only way that I can look at it is, okay, these are the people that I know, here's who's below them, totally makes sense to think that all those guys are pretty clean. People above them, I don't know. I refuse to believe that my buddies are the most talented on the planet, so that doesn't shade the folks on top. But I can get you very high in the standings with clean riders who I trust completely that you could trust as well. Now, when we get to Tade, um, is he around some shady people? Yes, like I said, the shady people got themselves very entrenched. Uh, I don't love Tade's agent. I don't love his team manager. Uh, Slovenia has a fair bit. There's a case, it wasn't that long ago, of a doctor who was a number of cyclists and skiers, and he was talking about how all the drugs glow through Slovenia because the, you know, the government's lax and there's, there's handoffs and the, the money, a lot of the stuff went through Slovenia. Uh, that doesn't feel great. Tadi doesn't even live in Slovenia. He lives in Monaco. So back in the Lance day, you know, they've got blood bags on the bus. Every rider on the team is in on it. Uh, all the staff are in on it. It's a big shady operation. That's definitely not going on now. Pragmatically, I don't see how Tade could get away with it by himself. You know, in the age of cell phones, like you just really can't sneak around like you used to. You can't get uh, discreet deliveries to your hotel room like they might have in 1997. Am I saying they're all clean? No, that would also be naive. Uh, EF had a dopey skin. They had a guy bringing uh, human growth hormone from Colombia into Italy like a week before the tour, and they're supposed to be the clean team. So I guess the only answer is uh, time will tell, hopefully. But it's certainly not as bad as some of the skeptics in the comments would say. And again, never, ever listen to Lance Armstrong about anything. Little things I like to look for. Uh, there was a clip where Ciccone was yelling at a guy for taking a sticky bottle too long. Now everyone takes a sticky bottle. A sticky bottle, if you don't know, it's when you're getting a feed from the car. You hang onto the bottle for a second or two, you kind of get them, let them drive you back up to speed, but you don't hang on from one group to another. Uh, you don't hang on for five minutes and, and kind of just give yourself a break. Uh, there's a line that kind of all the riders know when you're just slinging yourself back into the group versus cheating. Uh, Ciccone was yelling at a guy at the finish. That kind of just feels to me like Ciccone is not a guy who would take EPO. 
Remember in 2020, Tom Dumoulin complaining that riders weren't getting tested enough, that he wasn't getting tested enough uh, during COVID, which we all know now, of course, was a hoax. Sorry, I'm just kidding. My main take with that, though, was that Dumoulin was probably not messing around himself if he's mad that, man, I think so-and-so is getting away with something right now. Because a lot of folks would look at lack of testing and think, oh, here's a good time to, to do something shitty. Okay, moving on from that, uh, stage 20 was just an epic, looked like hill repeats, just a super lumpy, ugly stage profile. Again, the leaders kept the breakaway close enough to contest the stage win. That did not stop uh, Carapaz and Enrique Moss from attacking the crap out of each other for TV time, just while they were hemorrhaging time from behind. Just the whole way up, they were hitting each other. It's always really funny, once someone attacks and then gets caught, it's just really awkward when they have to keep riding together, because like now, you know, shots have been fired. And these guys are doing it when there's like just a pack of sharks coming up from behind them. So of course, on the final climb, Tade went, uh, Remco tried to see if Jonas was vulnerable, went for it himself. Jonas was like, nah, I'm going with Tade. And those two took it all the way to the line. They finally caught Carapaz around a K to go. Carapaz did the thing where like when I'm riding on PCH and I catch a guy who's going half my speed and then he sits on and like starts attacking me. But when the top two guys started racing for the line, he came off pretty quick. And Tade was just looking back like, all right, when do I start my sprint? When do I start my sprint? And in one pedal stroke, he won the stage. Really in the sprint, he managed to win the stage solo. He actually put a few seconds on Vingago in the sprint. He was the only one in the photo. I think that's his fifth stage win of this tour. Sorry, Cav. It kind of felt like Tade raced that mercifully, not attacking even earlier. So Tade goes into the final time trial with a five minute lead. That brings us to the time trial. Uh, armchair race organizer, having a TT the last day is, you know, from a Fignon Le Mans perspective, it could be awesome, but most likely that's gonna backfire into an absolute snooze. Time trials are historically a snooze anyway for almost everyone participating. Like I did not need to see, uh, no offense, I don't need to see Gramai riding his TT bike super slow up the hill. We had Cavendish crossing up, posting, you know, good for him, post up, cross the line, but it's just really funny when it happens in the Darth Vader helmet. TT helmets were always funky and dorky, but they've managed to get worse this year specifically. And that's the photo for Cavs' finale of the tour. I mentioned there's gonna be a lot of dudes who have no goals in this time trial other than to finish, and they're just trying to make time cut. They went out and partied last night. Listen, I'm happy for everyone, but I don't need to watch those hungover guys soft pedaling, waving to the crowd. Also in general, pull one out for all the sprinters who the whole last week was super hard. Uh, all the sprinters who just rode and finished just so they could not have a DNF by their name when they knew they had no shot like the last five stages. Especially with the Olympics coming up, it'd be super tempting to kind of drop out and get a little rest. And then all day they're showing whoever's in the hot seat and his reactions when someone passes him, doesn't pass him. It's just so lame. So Tide goes into the final stage with a five minute GC lead. Now it's always good to see who wins the stage, but realistically it's between the top three anyway. The top 10 overall could move around a little bit, but really not likely to make this stage a must watch. Tide would have to like break a leg or something the night before, and he didn't. He was just rode it super smooth, he looked great. Honestly, it did seem like he put in more time on his TT bike than last year. I feel like he learned from that mistake. No surprises in the TT results, really. Uh, other than Derek G, every time we're like, oh man, Derek G is good and we get used to it, he does something else to surprise us even more. Uh, not quite enough to beat Mateo and the GC, even though Mateo had a little bit of a crash. But both of those guys, just really fun to root for and watch develop. Overall, I gotta say, I know this wasn't their choice as the Olympics going on, but I'm looking forward to the Champs-Élysées again next year. I miss it. There's gotta be one, like, amazing American fan who's sitting on a curb in Paris today just like where's everybody at he's got all his flags and he's ready to watch the race just doesn't play close attention but don't worry dude it'll come back next year unanswerable hypothetical how would Jonas Vingago have done in this race without the crash a lot of people are kind of bemoaning oh man the tour is going to be boring it's going to be kind of Eddie Merckx for the next few years Tade is going to be this dominant boring race uh I think Vingago would have won if not for his crash I think we would have absolutely had a thrilling race to watch beginning to end but I would gamble on Vingago if he'd come in healthy. Who will be the best place to watch the tour this year? Uh, TV. I want to watch it on TV. You know, France looks lovely, but it was also super hot, and you're standing there all day waiting for the race to come by, you know, while dudes get, get ready their banana hammocks, try and get on TV. That part is kind of, kind of fun. Everyone loves complaining about Peacock. So here's my biggest complaint, and it's nothing about the commentary. It's the algorithm on their thing. Every morning I go on and I watch the tour, and the next day I go to watch the next stage of the tour, and it doesn't show up in the For You algorithm feed. They have not figured this out yet. Like, when I go on HBO and I watch Sopranos episode four, they're gonna be like, hey, you might wanna watch episode five. Peacock makes me go through and search and type in Tour de France, stage whatever, and I lost count three weeks ago. 
surprise winner from this Tour de France. Tempting to go with Thingago just because he did so well given the crash, but we've talked about that enough. Um, I'm going to give it to Abrahamson just because everyone forgot about him in the last week. That dude really put a stamp on it. He was in breakaways and then doing leadouts. Uh, absolute monster rider. Looking forward to seeing what he can do in future years. Okay, so our top 10 overall, uh, we've got Tade, of course, Jonas five minutes back, three more minutes to Remco, uh, Joao Almeida on Emirates, Landa Quickstep, Adam Yates Emirates, Carlos Rodriguez Ineos, Mateo Jorgensen Visma Lisa Bike, uh, Derek G, Israel Premier Tech, and then Chicone on Trek. We'll go through the stage winners real quick too. Uh, Bardet, stage one, remember that breakaway on the super challenging first stage? Stage two, I'm sure I'm pronouncing his name wrong, sorry. Uh, Vakalin from Arkea. Uh, then we get Germay. Stage four, Tade. Stage five, some guy named Mark Cavendish, you might remember that. Sprint stage, Gronowagen. Uh, TT, Remco. Another sprint, Germay. Then Turgis got one for Total Energies. Stage 10, Philipson finally shut everyone up. 11, Vingago when Tade got a little bit cocky. 12, Germay again. 13, Philipson. 14 and 15 were Tade, 16 Philipson again, 17 Carapaz, who wore yellow early on, but really still, I would say, saved it for EF at that point. 18 Campanaire scores one for Lotto Destiny, 19 and 20 Tade, and the time trial, Tade makes it six. All right, so teams, who's happy, who's sad? You know, what's invisible here when you're looking at how the teams do is that the top teams have four times the budget as some of the teams are talking about here. So I think they're realistic about their goals. They don't want to come out with nothing. They want to get some TV time and get some results, but they're happy with what they get. I'm going to factor in team budgets here and those expectations along with it. Emirates, of course, they're happy. Uh, Visma can't be too mad. They were going for the win, but two guys in the top 10 in the stage is pretty good. Watt Van Aert, probably a little salty. He didn't get his. Jaco, one stage win with Grunewagen, not terrible. Ineos, best result is Rodriguez GC. They're not stoked. They really needed a stage win. They didn't pull it off. Uh, for the budget that they have and kind of, you know, six years ago, think about how well they were doing. They had bad luck with Pidcock out, COVID going around, but they've got to be going back to the drawing board after this. Lytle Trek, kind of same. Uh, top 10 overall, probably not what they were going for. Even worse, uh, Decathlon, AG2R, nothing. Crickets. Uh, Bahrain, crickets. Sudol, they're going to be happy with Remco's situation. Bora, lost Roglic, didn't have a plan B. Historically, Roglic is the kind of guy that you sort of need a plan B for. They come out with nothing. Grupama FDJ, nothing. We can't wait to see them pulling their hair out on Netflix in 11 months. Alpsen to Kunick, Philipson took care of it. Uh, shout out to Matthew Vanderpoel, who just really rode selflessly in the leadouts. It's interesting to see a rider of his level be selfless at the Tour de France, but he's got nothing to prove, and Philipson's the faster guy. Uh, EF turned into the Carapaz show this year. They threw all the support behind him. He didn't pull it off for the GC, but I think coming in in polka dots at the end, uh, stage win, the yellow jersey early on, they'll be happy with this tour. Lotto Destiny, small budget team, stage win, they're good. Israel Premier Tech came in with a stage hunting crew and ended up, oh, actually, Derek G, top 10, we'll take it. Kofidis, I forgot they were in the race. Bad times. Movistar, Moss kind of up there going for the stage win a couple times, but didn't pull it off, nothing for them. Arkea, stage two, they'll take it. Intermarche, of course, they're happy with Grimaia Green Jersey stages. DSM, it feels like a year ago now, but the Bardet, one, two, first stage, they're good. Astana, they came in full commitment to Cavendish's record, and uh, they got it. Cool. Uno X, no stage wins, but Abrahamson really put a stamp on the race the first week. Got them a lot of polka dot time, a lot of TV time. They're probably cool. Total Energies, French team, they got their stage win. They're happy too. One final armchair organizer, and I've been saying this for years. The Tour de France, when it first started, it was an individual sport. Uh, it turned into a team sport, and the race did not evolve with it. When they do the final results, when they do results day to day, they should not say Tade won the race. They should say UAE won the race. I think that would be that would obviously give more value to the sponsor, getting their name. In. They don't say LeBron won the game. They say the Lakers won the game. They need to evolve into that, into a team sport that they are. I think that would create a lot more value for the sponsors, getting their names out there, and less doping incentive, more teamwork, a better race overall. This will likely never happen, but I have to get it off my chest once in a while. Okay, that is it for me and this Tour de France. Uh, thank you all for watching. Check out InvisiFrame and all my other sponsors. Don't forget to go outside and ride your bikes as well. See ya.